All righty. We are live. Well, that was easy. <laughs> What's going on, everybody? Happy Monday. My name is Tay Whiteside. We're here at my shop called Lift Arc Studios. And um, I'm trying this live thing out. So got it up on the computer. Everything's working. Awesome. We got audio. Cool. So I was going to try to go live on my GoPro Hero 8 Black on YouTube. It says it's possible. There's an option in the app for it. Uh, but every time I tried to do it, it was not working. So I'm using my Samsung phone and we're going live here. So this corner of the shop, uh, if you've seen some of the past videos, this is the metal fabrication area. I am on my personal favorite uh, welding table. It's a half inch thick piece of steel, welded some I-beams, nice and flat and level. And um, today, as the title might have mentioned or foreshadowed, uh, I'm doing some aluminum uh, TIG welding practice. I have a customer dropping off uh, their car later today and he wants he has contracted me to do a custom intercooler piping um, fab on his uh, sort of high power Subaru WRX. So fabricating aluminum pipes from the uh, turbo to the intercooler and then from the intercooler to the throttle body. If you're not a car person, don't worry about it. Um, but if you are curious about welding, specifically AC welding on aluminum, stick around because I'm going to take you with me. Uh, sort of a proof of concept, honestly, for this uh, YouTube live. I've done a bunch of Facebook lives in my, in my days as a social media marketer, but I haven't really gone live on YouTube much. So we're going to see how it goes. Video quality looks okay, passable. Uh, again, I was hoping to go live on the GoPro, but we're going to use the phone and power through just, as, just to see what happens. So um, first off, seven people watching, say hi in the chat if you have the ability. Thanks for taking time out of your Monday, maybe lunch break, Monday lunch break. Have a little time to hang out with me. I certainly appreciate it. I'm gonna say something in the chat myself. Hey everybody. What's up Garrison? Yeah, aluminum welding is, uh, it's tough, but um, I seem to have developed a special relationship with aluminum. Um, it has helped a lot by the welder I'm currently using, but even so, behind the, uh, that welder, there's one that I bought from Eastwood, the TIG 200 ACDC from Eastwood like six years ago. And honestly, that thing, it doesn't have many settings, but it still welds aluminum really nice. Uh, I used it to make custom intercooler piping on my 240SX drift car last year, and everything went great. Um, but today, they have a special treat in the shop What's up, Matt? How you doing, man? Thanks for watching. Uh, today, I have a special treat in the shop. I have my hands on a Miller Dynasty 210 TIG welder. Um, this is the not the DX version. This is the simplified version, so the menu and interface is much simpler. Uh, I'll show you guys what's going on there. So um, you can kind of see it. So you got four settings, AC TIG, DC TIG, DC stick, and AC stick. Uh, we are on AC TIG because to weld aluminum, you need to be on AC, alternating current, sine wave. And uh, what we're welding is this aluminum pipe. I'm not 100% sure what the alloy is, whether it's uh, 30, I think it's 30, 30, or 60, 61, or 40, 43. There's a few different popular alloys of aluminum. <clears throat> this stuff's not crazy expensive, so I imagine it's not like the best nicest stuff you can get but for the application i'm going to be using it for it is perfect uh, well matt today's your lucky day hang out and uh, i'm going to do some welding very soon so anyway uh to set up to start with you know you can weld aluminum with a mig welder or a wire feed you know um kind of sort of the most accessible kind of welder you can get but uh, it's not that great. I've used a spool gun in the past and it's just kind of, it's a little messy. TIG can be much cleaner. And here's how it works. So TIG stands for tungsten inert gas. And this is the TIG torch. I'll give you a close up here. So you have the cup, 
sticking out of the end, I have some tungsten, and this is pure tungsten. So when you weld aluminum, I just realized my fingernail is disgusting. But when you weld aluminum, um, it's best, I have found, to use pure tungsten. So if you're buying tungsten for your TIG torch, it's the stuff with the green, green bands on it. Uh, you can use serrated or some other types of tungsten, but pure tungsten is what seems to work the best. Um, so all this does is electricity comes out of here. And just like any other welder, you ground to the table or your work if you don't have a metal table. And between these two things, an arc will form. So um, that's sort of how welding works, is you use electricity, high concentrated amounts of electricity to melt metal, whether it be the base metal, the metal that you're trying to fuse, or the filler metal. Uh, so in this case, TIG, you typically, you've probably seen it if you've seen like hot rod shows or anything, any, if you've ever seen TIG welding, it's sort of the iconic visual of torch in one hand, filler metal in the other hand. And um, what's happening basically is you're creating a puddle of molten metal with the torch, with the electricity coming out the end of the torch. And once it starts to melt, you can add more. This is also aluminum, this filler wire. And typically you have filler that's the same alloy or a compatible alloy with the metal you're trying to weld. Um, <laughs> yeah, Dylan, working man's finger. I slammed this finger in the trunk of my car, actually. It, 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 I wish the story was cooler than that, but it's not. So uh, I'll make up a better one next time. So you melt with uh, the torch and the arc coming out of the torch, the high energy arc comes out of here into the base metal to complete the circuit. And as you melt things and start to create a puddle, you can dab and dab and dab. And, and these, these get eaten up. These get melted into the puddle. And once you go through a filler rod, you, you get a, another one and, and just keep cruising. So that is a very layman's explanation of what TIG welding is and kind of how welding works in general. Um, thank you, Garrison, for the compliment on my brick walls behind me. I pressure washed this entire building um, before I started moving things in. Um, if you guys haven't seen the renovation series also on this channel, go check it out. Me and only a few friends of mine took this 1917 building and uh, completely gutted it, went through all the machines and everything that was left in here and overhauled it into my new custom fab space. So go check that out. Also, while we're on the subject of YouTube, I know I'm classic delaying the inevitable. Um, this channel is called The Machine Shop and we named it that way because when we started it, uh, I didn't have a company. I didn't have Lift Arc Studios. I didn't have. I didn't really know that the the plan was to turn this space into my custom fab shop. So we just named it the Machine Shop, partly because we were surprised that the name the Machine Shop was actually available for a YouTube channel, and secondly because it was a machine shop when we bought this building. Now though, I do have some machining tools in here, but uh, I wouldn't say that I'm a machinist or that this is a machine shop. It's more of a custom fabrication shop. Um, I did keep a good amount of the machining tools. You can see the bridge port behind me and some other lathes and things that I will make operate again. Um, yeah, Matt, I'll, I'll get to that in a second about cleaning aluminum. Um, but so I think we're gonna change the name of this channel. I think we're gonna change it to just Lift Arc Studios. Uh, I hope, or something. But I just learned that you can change the name of your YouTube channel through your Google account. So pay attention to that. I will be very, uh, post a lot about it on social media just to let you know, but don't freak out if you see these videos continuing to come from a differently named YouTube channel. I just kind of wanted to name it something that's more applicable and kind of ties back to my business instead of the machine shop, which is videos taking place in a shop that doesn't have that many machines in it. Well, I have machines, but they're not machining tools. Anyway, long rant over. Just look out for a name change for the YouTube channel. And uh, Walker is just finishing up a really cool build video right now. I taught him how to weld in a day uh, with a MIG welder. We built him a custom desk. So later today, hopefully, maybe tomorrow, there'll be a new video up on the channel. So, um, David Rush, watched your entire series, visited Black Dog a few years ago and hope to get back to your city soon. Keep up the good work. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Um, 
I'd be lying if I said it has, I've kind of gotten in a, I haven't gotten in a rut lately, you know, um, taking on client jobs and trying to start making money out of here has uh, taken my focus away from the creative side a little bit. You know, I used to film kind of everything and now I get halfway through a project before I'm like, oh crap, I forgot to film this. But it is coming back to the forefront. We will be filming more things. And um, that I've found with my experience on Chet Savage Dogs is people's favorite part is the build, you know, coming along, seeing how people problem solve and, and um, hopefully taking some of your own inspiration from how this, I don't mean to sound ar arrogant or anything, but like how I design things and how I build things or how other people design and build things. I know I take a lot of inspiration from other creators on YouTube, like John Malecki um, and some others, uh, Alex Steele, this old Tony, people like that. And um, yeah, hopefully you learn a little bit from what I do. So we're going to get right into it. Enough talking. We're just going to do it. So. Yes, as Matt Taylor mentioned, you do have to clean aluminum pretty well. Although, there is a caveat to that. So here's an aluminum pipe. You can see aluminum when it comes from the uh, factory or the wherever you get it from, the whatever extruding or process, whenever you get it, there's an oxide layer on the surface. Um, aluminum corrodes or rusts, I guess. Um, in the presence of oxygen, creating aluminum, uh, aluminum oxide. And so that forms a layer on the surface of the aluminum that it is best to wear through. You can see on the end of this pipe, I've actually uh, wire brushed a little bit and I got through that oxide layer. Uh, although I did that a few days ago, so a new oxide layer has probably formed. So yes, the best way to do it is to take a wire wheel or a wire brush and scuff up the aluminum wear through that oxide layer and uh, expose the raw aluminum underneath because you'll have a much cleaner weld. Now, the other thing you can do, kind of a cheat code, is welders, you may have heard the term clearance effect or electronegative, electrode positive. Basically, you can set these things up on this Miller uh, Dynasty, it's called balance, AC balance, or sometimes clearance effect. Basically what happens is, the. I'm not going to get into the details, mainly because I don't know all of the details. I just kind of know how it works. Um, if you turn the AC balance down to more electronegative, um, it will actually have this effect on, as you're welding where it sort of burns away that oxide layer before you, like right before your arc gets to where you're welding. So you can kind of cheat a little bit by messing with the clearance effect and uh, making your electrode a bit more electro positive yes less electro negative uh, which pushes more electrons into the metal and um, kind of works away some of that burns through the oxide layer so you don't actually have to clean it that much if you do it that way in this case i kind of burn through some of these wells without cleaning anything and they're not the most beautiful welds in the world but they are way structural and uh, everything worked out just fine. So we will do a little cleaning today, but then we're gonna go right into it. So first, first thing I'm gonna do is take this to the bandsaw and just cut it in half, and then we'll just weld it back together. So I'll take you with me. This is an old bandsaw that I just got a new blade for. This was actually in the shop uh, when we got it. And so I'm gonna find a place to put my phone and turn it on. This thing doesn't sound great. I don't know what it is, but just bear with me. All right, there we go. Got two pieces of aluminum. <clears throat> and now I'm going to go ahead and take let's get the layer off here. <clears throat> I'm going to take a file. This file has a rounded profile. You can see that. So I just go inside the pipe, get the burrs off, all the stuff left over from the bandsaw blade. And then I go around the outside as well. Create a tiny chamfer. It's not really that important, but 
getting all that loose stuff off. Uh, Matt, I have not worked with titanium. Um, I hear it's actually not that difficult to weld, but I've never done it. I imagined if there was a machine that could do it, it would be a TIG welder, because you can weld just about anything with a TIG, because you can change your filler metal. You can change, they make thousands of types of filler metal, from steel to aluminum to alloys, nickel uh, rod for cast iron, there's all kinds of stuff you can weld with a TIG welder. It's kind of like the fancy version of brazing. Back before welders were accessible, they would use oxyacetylene, which is fire, basically, to weld. And you would concentrate the flame in a small location, just kind of like the arc does. And you would melt the base metal and you would introduce solder, which is like a, you know, a filler metal that has a much lower melting point because obviously fire, a flame, cannot generate the kind of heat that an arc can. So it's kind of one of the reasons why this became so popular. So I'm going to clean it a little bit with a wire brush, just enough to get any dirt or anything off of it. A lot that goes into a good weld is preparation. Cleaning your metal, if you're welding steel, you know, get grind away the mill scale, make sure there's no oil on it, like if you cut something on a bandsaw that has coolant, definitely clean it, clean all that coolant off. Use um, I mean, you can just use a, a nice rag, but you should use like some kind of acetone or something to get that oily residue off. Or some kind of degreaser, you know. It doesn't have to be acetone, but something to get the oil and grease off. This is just scuffing through the oxide layer a little bit, and then the rest of it will be taken care of with the clearance effect, um, the AC balance of my TIG torch. So appreciate y'all hanging out. I can't help but feel like I need to rush because people's attention span is so short these days. But with this kind of stuff, you really can't rush it. Um, learning how to weld in general is not something you can rush. And uh, I know for me, it took a lot of time and a lot of patience to uh, start getting to a point where I was fairly comfortable with welding. So I'm going to bend this down a little bit. So I have this cool clamp sitting in this machine vise. This is a pipe clamp. It's got these sort of adjustable pads underneath it that when you clamp it to a pipe, they adjust to the contour and hold it together. So I like using this to hold my pipes together, especially when I tack my first tacks together. So you can adjust everything here. We don't want it too tight because then it deforms the pipe. But there you go. You can see that we have the pipes clamped together. I'm going to rock this back so I can get to it. And there's our seam. I could have done more of a chamfer there, but we're going to go for it. I'm going to get this nice and close. I have no clue. I have no clue what this is going to look like on a phone camera. So we're going to go for it. Um, Right on, man. Garrison, thank you. Appreciate it. I need an excuse to just slow down and take my time. But uh, that's cool, man. So you do torch weld and braze. I would love to see uh, your work. I'd love to see your technique. I've been I've brazed once. Uh, I got the good fortune of going to hang out with Elliot, who is a local what's his last name. He's a local coppersmith here in the area, and he uh, for the show we got to hang out in his shop one day and do some copper brazing which was really cool he cut the copper and sort of leafed it together and then you braze the joint so that that was a really cool experience but he had everything dialed in he had the right torch the right filler flux the joint and everything so that that was cool to be a part of um dylan asked if i'm gonna purge by the way how you doing man dylan james good friend of mine from way back when good to see you buddy um asked if i'm gonna run a purge on this or just weld it open so uh what he's talking about is Basically, when you weld, you probably see in there, when you weld pipe, you're obviously welding on the outside of it, and uh, you're not really doing much to the inside. So sometimes you can get what some people call like sugaring, 
which is just kind of what it looks like when the weld uh, kind of bubbles through the backside. Um, so the other part of welding that I didn't mention is that there is shielding gas coming out of here. In this case, 100% argon. And what argon does is it creates a bubble around the, the arc and all that freshly melted metal so that it doesn't immediately uh, oxidize. The shielding gas prevents, it displaces all the oxygen around the arc area uh, so that it doesn't immediately oxidize and contaminate and therefore you're left with a much stronger weld. So what Dylan's talking about like uh, uh, doing purging basically you would also, you would cap both ends of the tube that you're welding and then pipe argon into the, um, into the pipe itself, which would then mean that the, arc, the weld is shielded on the outside by the gas coming out of the torch, and it's shielded on the inside by the gas that's flowing through the tube or being pressurized into the tube. Um, I don't, I have, haven't done any uh, interior purging. I probably should start. Uh, for this case, though, I, I'm not really this thick enough aluminum to where most of the weld sits on the surface and doesn't really make it to the inside. I'm sure it's probably technically right to do a fill to, to uh, fill purge with uh, argon, but in this case, not going to do it. Um, I may do it once I start working on uh, my customer's car when he drops it off later today. Um, but I don't have any of those plugs, and I don't have. Uh, I need to get uh, an adapter. For my argon tank up here uh, so that I can run a separate line into the pipe so we're just gonna go for it so my joint is tight the metals pretty clean and I have my welder set up I'm using a foot pedal because uh, I don't have any other way to trigger this right now a lot of guys sometimes will get triggers that mount to the TIG torch itself so you can turn the arc on and on with uh, your thumb or pointer finger I like a foot pedal if you have the ability to use it. Uh, I'm sitting on a stool and my foot pedal's on the ground, obviously. And um, the foot pedal is progressive. So the more you push down, the more amperage comes out of the TIG torch. And here you set, in this case on the, the Miller Dynasty 210, you set the ceiling. So this 100 amps is what would, what would come out of the torch if I floored the foot pedal. So the cool part about that is I can work up to it and then I can come down gradually. Aluminum absorbs heat really weird. Um, it's actually a fantastic conductor, um, even more so than copper. So when it's cold like this, this pipe is cold, room temperature, you have to dump a lot of heat into it at the beginning uh, to get it welding. But as the metal heats up and the heat spreads all the way around the pipe, you need to be able to taper taper that uh taper the amperage down because now it's heat soaked now all the heat is is the pipe is hot and therefore it requires less additional energy from the torch in order to melt the metal and create a weld so if you're not careful uh, and you just floor it wide open it might start working pretty well for a little while and then you'll notice the 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 metals are starting to melt away you're creating you're burning holes through things and that's because the metal itself is heat soaked and you need to back off that amperage a little bit because you don't need to add as much as you did in the beginning. So, um, yeah, for sure. Uh, Dylan said to use you know, aluminum uh, foil to cap one in. You can definitely do that. They also sell these like proprietary plugs. So I am gonna throw my mask on and we're gonna tack. So one thing I do, in this case, when you're building something for an automotive application, you, um, it often needs to fit in a very specific orientation, you know, connecting two members. In this case, it would be a pipe going in between the turbocharger and the intercooler or from the intercooler to the throttle body. The in and out, the both ends of that pipe need to line up to very specific locations. So what I do is I order, you can see over there, I ordered a bunch of pre-bent aluminum pipes, U-turns, 90s, 45s, and all that. And I'll use my bandsaw to cut sections apart and sort of piece them together to wind the pipe around where it needs to go. And typically, it, you don't want to be welding in the car. I like to be welding on a bench, obviously, because of the foot pedal and everything. So what I'll do is, like, say these two pieces of pipe had to meet up in space somewhere in the engine bay. You get them close to where you want them and take, like, a Sharpie 
and make two lines like bridging the gap once they're where you need them. That way you can take them back apart. You can go to your bench, put them in your clamp, and then line those lines up and you know whatever bends you have that are you're welding together, you know that when you tack it together, they're gonna to be in the exact same orientation that they were in in the engine bay. So there's a little tip there for you. Uh, in this case, obviously, it's just practice. I'm not gonna do that. And they're straight anyway, so it doesn't matter. So my settings, I'm wanting, this is like eighth inch aluminum. I'm running 100 amps. My balance, AC balance is down as low as it can go, 60% to, to help me clean the metal. Uh, I'm running a 70 hertz. So AC, alternating current, is a sine wave. You know, it, the, it's not like DC where it's just like a, a water hose, you know, where everything's flowing in a sim same direction constantly. AC is on and off, back and forth, push, pull, push, pull, really fast. In this case, 70 times a second. Um, the AC power in your house runs at 60 hertz. Uh, in Europe, it runs at 50 hertz, I believe. So that's frequency. Uh, I have a little cheat sheet here, actually, that tells you what the frequency does. So when you run um, lower frequency, it spreads the arc out. So if you imagine the arc is like a nozzle on a garden hose, it spreads it out uh, and doesn't concentrate the heat all in one spot. Whereas when you crank up frequency, it concentrates the heat more in one spot, doesn't spread it out as much, but then you get more penetration because the heat has less space to wander around in. Um, so in this case, because it's a butt weld, I want to be really careful not to burn through. And it's easy to do because you don't have, you're not overlapping your metal. It's not like a corner joint. It's literally just butted together. And it's, if you burn a hole, you know, you got no backup. That metal just goes away. And then you're you kind of, then you, then you have to scramble and try to fill it and, and fix it. So, um, so I have it low, uh, I'm running 70 Hertz low as the machine can go to spread that heat out and heat across a bigger area and not just focus the weld right into the gap and maybe risk blowing it out. Uh, that was definitely happening to me the other day before I got my settings dialed in. I was blowing through. You can see here, I blew a hole through. And uh, I think the other ones I managed to fix, but when you fix them, even if you're able to fix them, they just look ugly. You kind of result in like a big glob of, of uh, weld, weld metal. And that might be fine on my personal project or something, but when I'm doing work for a client, I definitely want it to be something that looks good, he's proud of, you know, he can easily justify his investment in me to build him something. So try to do a good job, you know. Even if it's underneath something and no one's ever going to look at it, you should always treat every weld like it's going to be, you know, looked at. And especially in motorsports, you know, you have tech inspections and all that. Like people will be looking at your weld specifically for roll cages and things like that. Sometimes they even x-ray the weld. So do a good job every time if you can. So again, 100 amps, that's how much amperage comes out of the torch when I put my pedal all the way to the ground. 60%, uh, 70 hertz. Post flow for five seconds. So after I let off the pedal, the argon flows for another five seconds while the metal cools down and solidifies to keep any oxides from going in there. Uh, and that's it. Again, this is not the DX. This is just the Dynasty 210 base model. So there's not a whole lot of bells and whistles. They just kind of give you all the settings you need to do the job without getting super fancy. Um, now I won't even go into all the stuff the DX does. To, to show you though, that's what the screen on the DX looks like. And it's got all kinds of buttons and settings and all that. This has two knobs and one button. So it's a lot easier to figure out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do two tack welds. I'm going to just put one little blob of weld right in one spot. And then I'm going to rotate the tube and put a tack, a little bit, bit of weld on the opposite side of that weld. That way everything's held together and it's not going to move. And then we'll start running beads. So really curious to see what this is going to look like being that I'm recording it with my cell phone, but we are going to bring you guys along for the ride. Yeah, Matt Taylor, that's what grinders are for. I heard either you're either a welder or a grinder, you know, if you can't make a nice weld, get real used to using a grinder to make it flat. So here we go. Basically what I'm going to do is get my, my tungsten about a quarter inch from the metal. I'm going to floor the foot pedal. And as soon as I see it start to melt, I'm going to introduce a little bit of filler metal and then I'm going to back off and that should be that should be it. So, here we go.
again, that's why it's live. That is a total disaster. <laughs> total disaster. Uh, I burned right through and I was getting all kinds of weird, uh, God, it looks like cauliflower almost. I'm not exactly sure what happened, but we're gonna, we're gonna sand that down and try again. I knew this would happen, man. Right before I turned the camera on, I was laying down some great beads. Everything made sense. It was easy to start and stop. So that's just how it goes sometimes. So we're gonna clean this up. I might get my, uh, my die grinder with a flap wheel and sand it smooth and we'll just kind of try to fix it. Presser's not turned on yet today, but that's all right. I think we'll come back with a file. <clears throat> file that smooth a little bit. I don't really know what happened. This is kind of indicative of my relationship with aluminum. Sometimes it just works and sometimes it doesn't. And I am just not, not a pro yet. I don't do this every day. I consider myself uh, competent when it comes to aluminum, but not an expert. So we are going to try to tack again. I am not sure why I had that issue. Let me try to do a, a test burn on this little plate here. Burning hot. Let's see. Let's turn it down just a little bit. We'll go down to 90. That way it's not so crazy. All right, so let's try this again. My filler metal is crap. All right, so we laid a few puddles down, didn't have any blow through. Worked a lot better. I like to keep the wire brush on hand just to go through it. So I even had a gap there and I was able to bridge the gap on that one. So that worked a lot better. Just got a little, little, uh, little tack there. Um, <laughs> yeah, the aluminum's tough, man. I blow through it all the time, but we are tacked in two places now. So I'm going to just find, I'm going to go over here in no man's land somewhere and uh, try to run a little bead and see how we do. Much better, about an inch of bead. It's not, uh, not perfectly symmetrical, but we are stacking dimes, ladies and gentlemen. Things are starting to work. Uh, this pipe is very hot already. Aluminum absorbs heat like nobody's business. I honestly think I'm getting some weird effects with this filler. I'm gonna get a fresh piece of filler. Some guys like to clean their filler. Um, I don't think it's a bad idea. I'm gonna use a little Scotch-Brite pad and maybe run this filler through it. Clean off a little bit of the oxide layer that might be on the filler itself. That might, might explain why I'm having some contamination issues. So that should be nice and clean. This is still pretty clean. So let's, yeah, 
more positive. Um, but the problem with um, the problem with this uh, the Dynasty 210, it's a little too simple. In honest, in my opinion, I can only go down to 60% electronegative. I can't drop it down any further than that, um, which is kind of irritating. And maybe if you guys know how to how to really tweak this machine, you can hold the menu button, and go into here. You set your tungsten. I'm using eighth inch tungsten. This is your remote control, and then how you start is high frequency. Those are the only settings. So um, you get out of this menu. I don't know, man. I got the uh, I got the electro negative the ac balance all as low as i can get it as electro positive as i can get it um and it's i don't know still a little unpredictable for as expensive as this machine is i'm a little underwhelmed with that setting but maybe i'm missing something so we'll start running another bead here There we go. We're just gonna keep on keeping on. I'd like to make it a little hotter. So I'm gonna crank this up to 100 now that we're cruising. Get a little bit more burn in. Just keep running this, keep running this, this bead around. Happy days, everybody. Happy days. Things are working. There we go. We are starting to we're starting to end up with something that's pretty satisfying. So you can see there, things are starting to work the way they should. Got a pretty nice bead, fairly consistent. I could probably get a little bit more penetration out of it and have it sit a little flatter, but it is it is working quite well. Uh, Dylan, I'm using eighth inch tungsten and I'm using pure tungsten. So this is the green stuff. Um, tungsten usually has when you buy the tungsten, which is the part sticking out of the torch. Um, it will have like a colored band on it. Usually I'll show you this one. I don't know what this is, but this one has a light blue band on it. You can see that. I'm not even sure what that means. That's a big boy tungsten. Uh, so this one's green. Green is pure tungsten, and pure tungsten is really good, in my opinion, for aluminum. There are other tungstens that will do aluminum, like uh, serrated, which is gray, um, and probably another one here and there, I'm sure. But um, yeah, finding the right speed is hard. So uh, that's a good point. Dylan asked if it sharpened the tungsten. Uh, when you're welding steel, you definitely want to have a nice point on your tungsten most of the time. And these are just blanket statements, so don't hold me to any of this. But in my experience, I like to sharpen the tungsten to a nice point. Uh, when you're doing aluminum, uh, because of the way the AC works, it, it goes back and forth out of the uh, in and out, in and out, in and out of the end of the, the uh, tungsten. Sorry, excuse me. And... Um, when the, the arc goes out, that's one thing, but when it comes back up into the tungsten on the reverse uh, stroke, if you will, of the AC current, it blunts that tip of the tungsten because it's not meant to go back in. It, it's meant to come out, out of that point. So when you're welding aluminum, you inevitably end up with a ball on the end of the tungsten, and there's kind of an art to getting the right ball. Uh, the quickest way I've found is that when you, before you weld, 
crank your welder all the way or pretty heavily into the electrode positive, which means if the, the electrode's positive and electrons are negative, they attract. That means most of the electrons are going up into the tungsten. And that blunts it a lot faster. That creates a ball pretty fast. So you crank it to electrode positive, hold it over a test piece of metal, blast the foot pedal of your switch till you have a nice little ball, and then turn the balance back to somewhere happy, and then you can keep welding. Um, again, this machine doesn't go super electrode positive, which is kind of annoying. So all I have is kind of a tiny little ball. It's like a ball on the end of a point. So it seems to work. Um, it focuses, you know, the bigger the ball, uh, the more uh, broad the arc kind of can be. In my, again, in my experience. Um, but we're just going to rock it. I like how things are kind of working out right now. And we're just going to keep going and get through this pipe. sure what happened there hit a little bit of contaminants probably I didn't clean this pipe as good as I probably should have when I get to the customer's car uh, probably spend a little bit more time cleaning but I didn't want this whole live stream to be just about me cleaning so there you go so oh god we're gonna just keep cruising seems to be working And that last little bit was the hole that I blew through earlier. So I spent a little bit of time hanging out there and filling that back in. Not the prettiest weld, but that's why we practice. So I just have this last thing. One thing I'm not good at yet is when you're welding pipe, you kind of need to keep your, your arc uh, angle, torch angle, pretty perpendicular. That kind of goes with uh, a lot of aluminum, but especially a butt joint like this. So as you weld around a pipe, you need to be able to sort of change the angle of the torch all while keeping the, the tungsten the same distance or a similar distance from the arc and thinking about filler metal uh, and using your foot to control the amperage. Like there's a lot of things going on here when you're, when you're TIG welding. Um, it's very much sort of like patting your head and, and rubbing your belly. It's, I imagine drummers have a similar learning curve when you learn how to drum, you know, because you're using every limb that you have. The only thing I'm not using is my left foot. So you want to keep it perpendicular, keep it fairly close. And of course, you, you don't want to dip your tungsten into your weld metal because then you get contaminants on the tungsten and you need to kind of go regrind it. Sometimes it'll clean itself off and kind of shrug it off, but sometimes it really affects the weld. Um, yeah, so it just takes a lot of practice and I can teach someone how to weld in a day that can get something that's passable, but to really get good, you got to get your own welder. You got to be able to just put your butt in the seat for a long time and just get really familiar with the process. Um, welders actually, you can get some pretty cheap welders these days that do an okay job. Again, my Eastwood TIG 200 back there. Uh, one of the best TIG, starting TIG welders I've ever found. It's about 700 bucks. It goes up to 200 amps. Not sure what the duty cycle is, but it does steel, aluminum, anything you want. Good machine. Uh, so I'm going to finish this up and then we'll take a look at it.
had another hole there I needed to fill. This is uh, not the cleanest example. You know, this is a live look, everybody. All those weld porn guys, you know, Dabs Wellington, all those guys on YouTube, Instagram. They have way more seat time than I do. And they specifically just hone the craft of stacking beads and laying dimes, whatever phrase you like to use. But you can see that I have potential. There are parts of the weld that look very predictable, very consistent. And then uh, one thing I got to get better at is my stops and starts. So when you start, stop a bead and then start back up, you can kind of see every time that I did that. And there's kind of an art to getting, getting rid of those stops and start marks. But you know, overall, good weld. Um, they only had some blow through on the inside for when I had to concentrate a bunch of heat uh, and fill those holes that I made early on. But very passable weld, just not the sexiest thing in the world. So again, clean your metal, take your time. I have a habit of rushing things, not only videos and talking, but also my work, because I just want to get it done. But I need to slow down and, and take Take a little time to, to make it right because someone else is going to be looking at it at some point and you want to feel good about the work that you do. So yeah, that's, that's kind of it. Um, thanks Garrison. Garrison said I'm a good teacher. I appreciate it, man. I, I am not the best welder by any means, um, but I, I taught myself and uh, I feel like that helped me, it helped me become better at teaching people just because I made a bunch of mistakes on my own and uh, you learn from them. I encourage mistakes. Mistakes are good. Um, just important to once you make a mistake, you should take time and realize what happened, why you made the mistake and how you can fix it. Uh, you're on YouTube right now. YouTube and Google are some of the, the two biggest search engines in the world. So when you, you know, if you mess something up, like I keep blowing through my welds or I'm getting a bunch of contamination, just Google that, you know, type in what you're welding on, all that. And there's probably some forum post out there or something like that, that somebody has had the same problem because welding is not new. It's been around for a long time. And there are guys out there that have encountered every single mistake that you're, you have made or will make and even more. So these are just my thoughts. I'm sharing what I've experienced over the years and what, how I've sort of learned to weld. I actually learned to weld left-handed. Most right-handed people put the torch in their right hand and feed with the left hand. I've, I'd started doing it backwards because I found that it took more dexterity to feed the filler metal than it did to run the torch. So I was like, well, I'm going to put the hardest task in my right hand and the second hardest task in my left hand. Uh, and that's probably why I'm not that good at changing the torch angle as I'm going around a round pipe. But that's all right. The good thing about TIG is that it does kind of make you a little bit ambidextrous. You, you learn to use your non-dominant hand better and have a little bit more control over it and learn to slow down. And um, once you start welding it, you tend to get you know panicky, like there's no turning back now. I've already turned the arc on, no going back. But look at what's happening, pay attention to it, and uh, correct one thing at a time if, you know, Think about how far away your, your torch is to the metal, um, how fast you're moving, how much filler metal you're feeding in, how hot it is. If you're on a foot pedal, you know, play with that a little bit. So lots to learn, way more than I could ever cover in one video. Um, this was basically, uh, this was honestly just a test for me to do YouTube Live. Haven't done YouTube Live in a long time or ever. <laughs> I've done a lot of Facebook Lives, but not a whole lot of YouTube. So. Uh, I'm on my cell phone. We'll get a better, better camera to do it with later. But the client's dropping off his car today at three, and then um, I'll probably start fabricating the uh, the system for him this week. So excited about that! I'm gonna spend the rest of my day practicing. Uh, that way, I don't make a f myself on a customer's car, and uh, just because I, I like to practice. And I, I aluminum is something that I'm not consistent at yet. Some, I have great days and then I have awful days. And sometimes I don't even know why things change from day to day. It just seems like the energy is off. <laughs> and I don't mean that energy, I mean this energy. So, um, yes, 
While I have you, today we have a build video going live uh, today on this channel, which again will probably be renamed because it's not really a machine shop. My company is Lift Arc Studios, and uh, it's more of a fabrication space. So I don't want to send the wrong idea by calling it the machine shop. And then people come here for machining videos and all they see is idiots welding. <laughs> so um, there are some machining tasks that happen in here from time to time, but it's certainly not a machine. I'm not making custom drive shafts and bearings all the time. So even though I'm not opposed to it. So thanks for watching. I appreciate you guys. Uh, looks like it's about 50 minutes into this video. Um, wow. Thanks for hanging out. Appreciate you guys. Um, Garrison, yeah, I thought you were, I was a lefty. Yeah, I just learned wrong. So thank you all for hanging out. Um, Oh, let's see. New comments. I've been bad at reading the comments, guys. Sorry about that. Old Clossing. I learned aluminum welding with counting to three all the time in my head. Put in filler, take rod out of the puddle, and wait. Move on. Yeah, you definitely get into a rhythm. You kind of, you, I wish the way I filmed this that you could see what's happening in the arc, but I doubt it. It's so bright. You create a puddle. Once the puddle is liquid, you add material, and then you back off the torch. Uh, well, you pull the filler out and then you advance the torch and then the puddle happens again. Drop that. Add material. Pull it out. Move. Add, move, add, move. Um, and it's different for every joint. Inside corner joints, outside corner joints, butt welds, lap joints. They're all different. They require different techniques. Sometimes you see, you hear the term walking the cup. That is when you kind of get this back and forth motion with your torch and that just helps spread the weld over a wider distance there's a million ways to weld um this was just a peek into how i've learned so far so thank you guys for hanging out uh hope you like uh yeah it is similar to soldering um you kind of can go back and forth uh it's all about following that heat you want to you want to pay attention to where you're putting heat where you need the heat are you putting it where you need it or are you wasting it somewhere else um and you can always kind of overcorrect a burn through by suddenly adding a bunch of filler and try to correct it. So there's ways that you can learn to adapt as you go. But again, I'm not a professional. Thanks for listening to my ramblings. Um, look out for that name change for our YouTube channel. It's going to be the same channel. You don't, I, hopefully you don't have to resubscribe to anything. Uh, in fact, I'm quite sure of it. So you, nothing should change on your end except the channel name. And uh, stay tuned later when I teach uh, my buddy Walker, my video editor, how to weld in one day by building him a custom metal desk. So stay tuned for that video. Thank you guys so much. I'm sorry I have been uh, absent video wise, but we have been working on all kinds of things. And I have just been trying to prove the concept of my new business, getting client jobs in and out, trying to make a little money in this, in this weird times and, and pay the bills and keep the lights on. So thank you guys for watching. Go make something. If you're interested in welding, and you want to get into it, um, it they can get quite expensive. I highly recommend looking at Eastwood, eastwood.com. They do not sponsor me, although I'm open to it. Uh, but a lot of the, the first purchases I made for fabrication equipment was from Eastwood because they, they seem to occupy the, a good happy medium between cheap and quality. You know, it's affordable. It's not total junk. It's actually quite usable. This TIG welder I bought from Eastwood I've had for six or seven years and have dogged the crap out of it and it keeps coming back for more so look at the cheap stuff but don't buy like harbor freight i wouldn't do that and i would stay off of like aliexpress and ebay and whatnot unless you're buying used miller or lincoln or hobart you know so go for a name brand everlast uh um what's the other one fronius there's some good good tig companies out there so you can spend as much money as you want Anyway, thanks again, liftarcstudios.com. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Lift Arc Studios. And um, yeah, we'll see. I'll learn how this went and we'll check in later with another one. Bye guys.